Hello everyone, my name is Nizam. I work on the database engineering team at Facebook. And today I'm going to talk about uh, InnoDB compression and what we needed to do to make it uh, work for our uh, servers. Um, feel free to interrupt at any time, uh, but I may give brief answers and we're going to have, uh, we're going to hopefully have a question section in the end. So I'm going to talk about, um, uh, so we didn't actually rewrite the compression that InnoDB uses, so I'm going to talk about, talk more about the InnoDB compression itself and the, the performance improvements and bug fixes that we need to do to make it work, but those, nevertheless, those improvements and changes were important because uh, after all, they're uh, what uh, allowed us to use compression. So um, first off, uh, why use compression? Um, you know, there are obvious reasons, but there may be some reasons that you don't uh, necessarily think firsthand uh, that will, uh, that may actually make you want to use compression for your uh, deployment. So, um, you know, it saves this space. You can use the existing servers for a longer time. It can allow you to buy fewer servers if you're building out a new data center or if you're buying new servers. Uh, it may allow you to buy better hardware uh, without too much increasing cost. And by that, uh, I mostly mean S SSD and flash disks. Um, so if you, you know, if you, um, if your data is compressible enough, uh, then you might actually, the, the cost of buying SSD may actually be equivalent to cost of buying, uh, you know, uh, the number of disks, uh, you know, for the uncompressed MySQL. And also, uh, it can reduce IOPS, and the reason for uh, the reduction in the uh, number of IO operations per second is, uh, is uh, because of the smaller page size, um, which, uh, which means, uh, Fewer uh, disk, uh, you know, fewer disk block size reads. Okay, so um, so we're going to talk about the impact of compression on our production. So this is uh, the graph of the average database size from one of our data centers. As you can see, uh, up until the first red arrow, it's without the noise. It's about uh, it's like a linear increase. Uh, and that's that's typical. That's the typical growth of our uh, database size. It, it linearly increases as users uh, enter more data into Facebook. So, um, so and we, you know, after starting uh, deploying compression, and we deploy only gradually because of our scale, uh, we see those drops, and uh, we have a 90% drop. Uh, you know, we have a 90% uh, case, and we have an 81% by the end. These percentages take into account uh, uh, the data growth. So it's not, um, it's not 90% of what it used to be uh, in, in when it was 100%. It's the 90% of what it would be if we were using uncompressed, uh, uh, you know, uncompressed MySQL. <coughs> this is the uh, effect of compression in the number of IO operations per second at around the same time. So you can so these are these correspond to the exact same date. So uh, you can see that there's a correlation uh, between uh, the deployment of compression and uh, the num the the you know the uh, the uh, amount of I/O operations per second that the servers do on average. So this is about it. Sorry for not being able to give the numbers, uh, the exact numbers, but this will give you a good feeling about. Um, was there any question? Okay. Um, good feeling about uh, you know what compression can act that that compression can actually impact uh, production. So for uh, illustrating the shortcomings of the current uh, implementation of compression in InnoDB, I'm going to go through a Sysbench benchmark, and <coughs> I, I chose Sysbench because it's a, a common framework, um, but you could really uh, produce the same results in other. Uh, uh, frameworks or benchmarks. So this is the uh, default table schema for Sysbench. Uh, one thing to note in here is that it has um, two uh, string columns, one of which is one, 120 uh, uh, characters long and the other is uh, 60 characters long. So without even looking at the data that, you're, uh, that this uh, table has, one can uh, with high probability say that this table should be compressible. This is because you know it has two string columns. If it was just uh, two um, 
integer columns, then um, it might not be it, it, as easy to say that the, the table would be compressible. But we should, uh, assuming that the strings are not themselves compressed, we should get a good compression uh, for, for this table. So um, the configuration for the in-memory benchmark. Um, so the benchmark is in-memory just because I wanted to make it uh, fast. Uh, it's not really the, you know, the, the point that I'm going to illustrate holds for, uh, you, know, non, uh, you, know, you know, for benchmarks that are not in-memory, like IO bond benchmarks. So the buffer pool size was one gigabyte. Um, there were 16 tables, uh, each of which had this previous schema. There were uh, 250k uh, rows on each table. And the uncompressed database size was 1.1 gigabytes, so it's almost fits in memory. So we can, uh, with high probability, say, you know, this was an in-memory benchmark. You know, most of the time we weren't doing I/O. Um, and the compressed database size was 600 megabytes. And there were uh, on a, there were 16 threads uh, accessing the tables in parallel. Okay. So first off, uh, the load time. So this is the uh, load time uh, for uh, you know putting 250,000 rows in parallel uh, to 16 tables. So for uh, in, in order to compare the Facebook changes against the original MySQL, I grabbed uh, the latest 5.1 source from Launchpad, and I compiled it using the same configuration that we use. And uh, I have two. I have four configurations, uh, you know, compressed and uncompressed for original stock MySQL, and compressed and uncompressed for uh, for uh, MySQL with the Facebook patch. So uh, what we see here is that uh, the load time for <coughs> for uncompressed versions for both MySQL and uh, MySQL with the Facebook patch, they are about the same. Uh, at 30 seconds, and for the MySQL uncompressed version, MySQL compressed version, um, the load time is uh, all, more than the double load time, and for uh, the compressed version of uh, MySQL with uh, Facebook patch, um, it's uh, the load time is slightly larger, but much less than double. Okay, so this is to show, so this is the database size for each uh, configuration after loading the rows. So what the thing to notice here is that even though the, the uh, compressed MySQL with Facebook patch, even though it had a better load time, it did not actually increase the disk, si disk size. So, you know, it's a, uh, it doesn't come at any cost, basically, in terms of disk size. Um, and it's the, the compression ratio is about uh, 60 percent, between 50 and 60 percent. Okay, so this is the um, read-only benchmark. Uh, so after loading uh, the tables, uh, we just do a read-only OLTP benchmark that's provided by Sysbench. So um, we see the, the the thing to note here is that uh, again. In read-only benchmark, there is not there, there are not too many surprises. Uh, they both perform the same, and the throughput is a, is about the half of what the uncompressed uh, versions can do. <coughs> so both Facebook patch and uh, original stock MySQL perform about the same uh, with compression. Okay, so this is the main performance uh, improvement of Facebook patch. Uh, and it's illustrated in insert benchmark. So basically, the insert benchmark basically just inserts rows to tables in parallel. And as you can see, the throughput uh, for uh, you know uncompressed versions are about the same. The throughput goes down to one seventh, or actually no one um, about one fifteenth uh, when you when you compress stack MySQL with an insert benchmark. And it's only, um, you know, uh, half, it's only 50% with, uh, for the MySQL, for the compressed MySQL with the Facebook patch. So that's an improvement of about uh, 4x uh, for, uh, you know, over the stock MySQL. 
and this is the uh, and we're going to come to this later and and this and explain why actually StockMySQL performs poorly for this benchmark uh, by the way, uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. <coughs> so f it, this is 5.1 uh, from the source. So um, in terms of um, compression, there are not too many changes in 5.5 and 5.1. And I just picked 5.1 for no particular reason, really. So, um, <coughs> oh, and also this is the, um, so in order to uh, actually uh, uh, show that uh, the memory bound benchmark doesn't really matter, uh, we, I also performed an IO bound benchmark for inserts. So basically this is the same benchmark, but the tables were larger so that they wouldn't fit into memory. Uh, and uh, I got about the, I got similar results. You know, the stock MySQL performs, uh, you know, a little, little bit worse than the uh, MySQL uncompressed with the Facebook patch, but the compressed, uh, uh, you know, compressed stock MySQL performs again really poorly, and it's again uh, the the Facebook patch provides about uh, 3.8x improvement in throughput. So. so, with that, we're going to talk about um, how compression is uh, the, the designed and implemented in InnoDB and how it works. So again, um, you know, bulk of the compression uh, is handled by the existing code. So the changes that we did were just were bug fixes and in performance improvements. But they, that, th those are you know, what made it you know, make or break for us. So, so first of all, uh, we start with basics. Um, InnoDB by default has 16 kilobyte page sizes, fixed page sizes. Um, the compression basically, compressed uh, tables basically can have, you know, one kilobyte, two kilobyte, four kilobyte, or eight kilobyte block sizes. What this means is that InnoDB will try to compress each page to the specified block size. So if you have a, an 8K uh, block size, that roughly means 2x compression. And if you have 4K, uh, that means, um, you know, 4x compression. If you know, assuming that the data is really 4x compressible. Uh, block size is specified during table creation, and it's, it cannot be changed dynamically. So, um, if you if you wanted to change the block size later, that would be a dump and reload uh, kind of operation. Um, if you um, you know, if you're not sure about the compressibility of the data, uh, most data will, you know, if, but you're, uh, you know, you guess that the, the data is compressible somewhat, then 8K is the safest uh, block size to specify. And by default, actually, uh, if you don't specify block size, you know, DB chooses 8K by default. Um, if you have a table with blobs and bar charts that increase the probability of uh, the table being compressible, and if you have just a table with integers, you know, two columns that, that are only integers, it's likely that the table will not be compressible. Um, and if, you, if you're using MySQL for in-memory workloads, uh, you might, and you want to continue to use, uh, you know, continue, to, you, you might, you, if you want your workload to continue to be uh, in-memory, you might want to increase the buffer pool size when you uh, compress the tables because InnoDB keeps both the compressed and uncompressed versions of the, uh, of the pages in memory. So um, with, for example, with 8K blocks, you may then need to um, increase your buffer pool size by 1.5 to be certain that your workload is going to continue to be in memory. So this is um, how, we, how we create a compressed uh, table. This is the same uh, schema as the uh, previous one uh, that Sysbench uses. Uh, the only difference is in, in the last line where uh, the row format is specified to be compressed and key block size is uh, specified to be eight. So this is, uh, this is the table schema that, that I used for the um, compressed configurations in the, in the last benchmark. 
So, uh, going, so we, we're going to talk about uh, the features of uh, InnoDB compression and how it's designed. So one of the key components of uh, InnoDB compression design is the modification log. And I will try to uh, first describe why something like modification log is needed. So a naive way to implement compression for a database uh, like InnoDB is to just compress uh, every page when you're about to you know, flush the page to the disk. So that you know, when you evict from the buffer pool, you're about to, uh, you know, you, you're going to write the page to the disk, just compress it and write it. The problem with that approach is that the page may not compress to the specified block size. And uh, it's not clear what to do if, you know, if page compresses to, you know, a 16 kilobyte page compresses to uh, 9K, then you can no longer actually uh, flush the page. So another way to do, <coughs> another way to implement uh, compression is still, you know, less efficient but at least correct way to implement compression is you keep both of the copies in the memory. So you keep both, uh, you know, or you don't keep both, but you keep the uncompressed copy in the memory. And as you're doing updates on the page, uh, in order to make sure that the page remains compressible, you, on every update you recompress the page so that you make sure that uh, when, you're, when it's time to flush, your page is, uh, you know, compressible. The problem with that is you will be doing too many compression operations. So, you, you know, that, that, would be, that would also be inefficient. In order to avoid these, solve these problems, InnoDB keeps, uh, a, you know, a, a log of the modifications to the, to the page uh, in, the, in the bottom of the compressed page. And I'm going to uh, describe how that works. So the first time uh, the page is compressed, so the, so basically, by the, you know, uh, so the, on, on the left hand side, we have the uh, uncompressed page with some data on it. So there's some emptiness o on the page. So the, you know, the bottom part, uh, you know, represents the emptiness of the page. And when it's compressed, uh, you know, let's say the data on the page was about, um, you know, 10K, it may compress to 5, 5K. So, you know, you have now a, a compressed blob of length 5K, but you have an 8K compressed page, so you have 3K uh, space, and that space is used for the modifications to the page. So, um, so this, uh, <coughs> this diagram illustrates what happens when you insert to a compressed page, and how, you know, why you don't need to uh, recompress the page every time a page is updated. So as we insert, you know, we start with an empty modification log uh, the first time we compress the page. And then as we insert records, the modification log, you know, the, there, you know there, there would be entries in the modification log that actually specifies the insert. So, you know, the, lo the log entry will be something like, you know, a, a record was inserted at this offset and this is the data for the record. And similar, uh, similarly for, you know, updates and deletes, uh, we will uh, log those in the modification log instead of, um, you know, instead of recompressing the page. Okay. So what happens when the modification log is full? Basically, we need to recompress. Uh, so this is what happens in this, in this diagram. So basically, as we insert more records on the compressed page, uh, we, you know, we fill the modification log, and then at that point, we just recompress the page and start with an empty modification log uh, from the beginning. And notice that modification log now may be smaller than uh, what, it, what it was uh, in the beginning because now we have more data in the compressed, uh, compressed part of the compressed page. Any questions so far? Okay. Yes? Uh, no. You can't. So modification log is what whatever is left over from the compressed uh, compressed part. So if your you know if your compressed page if your if your block size is 8k and uh, then you know you will have and and your pages generally compressed to let's say average of you know 8 6k then you will usually have 2k modification log for those pages and then you know 
they will eventually, as you do more inserts on the page, you will run out of modification log and then you will recompress. And, and at some point, you won't be able to recompress to the desired uh, block size or you may not be able to recompress to the desired block size. And at that point, we just, you know, DB just splits the uh, compressed page into two. And, uh, you know, this is basically a node split and uses those uh, pages to insert the record and inserts the record to one of them. So this is basically, you know, you know, like you can start with a modification log of size, you know, 3K, and then the next time you recompress, maybe you will start with uh, 2K, and then it's going to go, you know, it's going to decrease uh, slowly, and then, uh, you know, when you, at some point you may actually find out that the data is no longer compressible to uh, to a data size of less than 8K. And then at that point, InnoDB splits the page into two. Okay, so compression failures are bad. So basically, when a page fails to compress, the entire time that's spent for uh, trying to compress that page is wasted. And by wasted, I mean uh, if we had a no, if we, if we uh, had a way to know uh, that the page would not be compressible then we wouldn't attempt to compress the page in the first place and that would save us a lot of uh, precious time while uh, the um, mutexes are held because it's, it, not only does it waste CPU cycles, it wastes the CPU cycles while some important mutexes are held. So another uh, <coughs> feature of uh, InnoDB compression is the unzip LRU. So this is basically <coughs> It's, very simple. it's a very simple idea. Basically, whenever you need to um, evict from the buffer pool, you uh, prefer evicting uh, uncompressed pages, uh, uncompressed copies of a compressed page over, uh, you know, over the entire, you know, over both of the copies. So basically, um, and this is only when you're assuming that you're IO bound. So let's, let's assume that we are IO bound. So we care more about the number of IOPS that we do than the number of compressions that we do. Um, so what happens is, you know, when, when you run out of uh, space in buffer pool um, and you need to evict a page, uh, InnoDB checks uh, the unzip LRU, which is an LRU of uncompressed copies of pages. And it just uh, evicts uh, the uh, head of L uh, those, that LRU uh, instead of evicting uh, another page. So, uh, and when you need to, um, and this eliminates, th this actually helps in two ways. So first of all, by evicting an uncompressed copy, you don't actually need to, uh, even if that, the page was dirty, you don't have to flush that page because a copy of that page still sits in the buffer pool, although in compressed form. Secondly, if you need to access that page later on, you can just uncompress that page and access it. Uh, instead of you know doing a read, read from the disk, and this is all assuming that you're you know for you it's more valuable to do fever IOPS than uh, you know fever compressions. If you if it's more valuable for you to do you know fever compressions than fever IOPS, then uh, InnoDB actually um, uh, has a way of determining this, and then InnoDB you know flushes from the normal LRU instead of the uncompressed LRU. So um, <coughs> another, uh, you know, uh, caveat about using InnoDB compression, uh, the default InnoDB compression is uh, that the uh, uh, compressed page images are written to the transaction log. So, um, so what 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 this means is when you whenever you recompress the page or the initial compression of the page, you write the entire compressed block to the uh, to the transaction log. The reason for doing this is 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 uh, to have um, <coughs> to guard against uh, crash recovery problems if uh, the Zlib library if if a future Zlib library changes uh, the size of the compressed page. So let me put it this way: so Zlib guarantees that it will uh, if you <coughs> if you give it some data and uncompress that data, you will get back the same data. 
but it does not necessarily, well, Zlib sort of does this, but like a generic compression algorithm does not necessarily guarantee that you will get the same data given the same input. So, you know, you, you may actually compress the same input twice and get a different uh, uh, output. Also, you know, most uh, compression libraries provide uh, backwards compatibility, but their future versions actually may be uh, may compress the data to the different size. So what this means is, um, let's say your database crashed and then you changed the zlib library that the database uses or maybe you're recovering on another server that has a different zlib library, maybe a future version or, an, or a, or a, or a um, past version. Uh, what happens is uh, as, you, you know, as you apply the log records, you may need to compress a page, and then if the, if the page is not compressed to the exact same size, then your modification log will be different. And that means that you know, as you're applying the uh, other log records, you may actually run out of uh, the modification log earlier than the, uh, the original server. So you're, you, know, you cannot rely on your transaction log records now. So this is, um, you know, this is a, a safety net, but I mean, it's um, arguably this. If you're aware of this fact, actually, this is not necessarily uh, a, the most efficient way of implementing, uh, you know, uh, you know, comp you know, the, the implementing compression for, uh, you know, this is not necessarily the best way to implement compression. Uh, so. Um, yeah, this also prevents against incompression, you know, the, the indeterminism in compression. But Zlib does not have any indeterminism. Actually, Zlib, uh, <coughs> if you use the same version of Zlib, uh, Zlib uh, guarantees that you're going to get the same output given the same input. So. Yeah, the problems with this is that it increases the number of read the log writes that you're doing, uh, and it causes more uh, fuzzy check, you know, it, 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 it increases the number of fuzzy checkpoints. So more IOPS. This is the um, <coughs> official advice on tuning compression uh, in, you know, uh, on uh, MySQL's website. So, um, so basically, I'm not going. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but uh, what it says is that if you determine that a table is causing more than one or two percent uh, of compression failures, then uh, you you don't want to compress that table. And this is um, this is not really useful information because it's really hard in Stock MySQL to determine you know what tables caused what tables contributes contribute to compression failures. Like you cannot you don't have. Uh, you don't have statistics to understand which tables are actually not compressible. So, um, and also, you know, given like a random data, um, I would guess that you know most of the tables will have more than one and two percent uh, compression failure rates, and yet, um, you know, they may get some benefit from uh, compression. So, uh, Facebook improvements. So the first thing that we had to do to deploy compression was to actually make it work. Uh, so to actually make the, uh, you know, prevent the server from crashing when compression is enabled. So, and also, you know, as we develop more features, we needed to make sure that we're not breaking anything, including crash recovery, which is really hard to test. So we needed to first, um, impl you know, implement some tests uh, to make sure of that. So we uh, edit some crash recovery tests in which we have a master and a slave. So we basically would enable compression on the master and uh, the slave would be uncompressed. So this, this you know, allows us to, for example, check the consistency of data when, you know, after a workload, you know, after you grill the master, uh, assuming that the replication is, you know, does not have bugs, you know, which is not a good assumption maybe, but um, you know, for the test cases, it was fine. Um, you can actually, you know, just uh, run a workload on the uh, master, 
and you can even crash the master and recover the master and then check for the, you know, compare the tables in the master against the tables in the slave for consistency. And uh, we also added, so one of the problems that InnoDB was suffering was uh, because compression was added later, um, there was a lot of, um, so InnoDB tries to predict when there is going to be a page split in the upper layers of InnoDB code. And, you know, compression is very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like the, it's, it's, it's a very, depending on how you look at it, it's, it's at the top of the stack. And, you know, the middle layers of the stack tries to predict when there is going to be a page split. And it cannot do that uh, in, a, in, a, in the correct way sometimes because it thinks that when you reorganize the page, for example, to defragment the page, page will remain compressible. And this is the wrong assumption. So this was one of the um, uh, one of the hard bugs in, uh, to find in InnoDB. And this bug, uh, you know, we were able to uh, you know, reproduce this bug by, uh, the, by simulating compression failures. So um, what, 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 what I mean by this is that there's a, you know, there's a function that actually just uh, is dedicated to compressing a page. So what we did is to uh, basically, um, if a system variable is set, then that function will just uh, fail randomly so that this will give us random uh, compression failures. And this, this allowed us to check, uh, you know, almost all of the code paths or the code paths that, that we care about that actually made assumptions about the compressibility of a page. And it actually found like three bugs that we didn't even see in production. And we fixed those bugs. So this was basically, this was the work to, to even begin improving uh, the performance of compression. So, <coughs> The, so the next thing was to add uh, table level compression statistics because we needed to know which tables to compress. So the statistics involved, you know, the number of compression operations that are performed on on, a, uh, on the pages of a table, the successful compression operations that are performed on a on the pages of a table, uh, the amount of time spent on compression, the number of uncompression operations, and the amount of time spent on the uh, uncompression operations. So this, you know, if, you know, we use this to determine initially what tables to compress. So uh, we also removed the compressed page, Im page images from the transaction log. Uh, I mean, I agree that by default it's, um, it's a good idea, it may be a good idea to uh, you know, log the compressed page Im images in the transaction log. But if you know that you're going to be using the same zilip on, you know, on, on the server, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, you're not going to change the zilip library uh, in between uh, when a crash, uh, when a server crashes and the crash and the server recovers, then you don't really need that uh, feature. So we just removed the compressed page images from the read log, and we introduced new log records to just, that just captures the compression itself. So it's, it's just basically a log record that says the page was compressed. Uh, so this is the main performance improvement. Uh, this allowed us to actually reduce the compression failures significantly. So what we do is basically we limit the amount of data that we can put on a page so that the page will remain compressible. So going back to what I described earlier about compression failures, if we had a way to know that uh, you know page will fail to compress, then we wouldn't even attempt to compress the page. So this is a way of achieving it. You know, We basically guess um, the maximum amount of uh, data we can put on a page before it fails to compress. And um, <coughs> Uh, here's a diagram to, to uh, show how it works. So this is the uncompressed page. So we basically have the, you know, have little data on, on top of the page. 
and uh, the padding. Is, so this is not exactly how you know the layout is, but this is just an illustration. So uh, you know, don't take it too uh, literally. So um, you know, data grows on, as we do more inserts. The data on the page grows, and as it increases, uh, and as uh, as the empty empty space on the page uh, approaches to the padding. Uh, the, the the amount of pad padding that we sp that we have, then uh, and when it actually you know when it, when it has you know uh, uh, smaller empty space than the padding value, then we just split the page. Uh, we just split the page before even uh, trying to compress the page. So this is what happens in the uncompressed uh, copy of the page, and this is what happens in the compressed copy of the page. So earlier, what would happen is you know, you would insert, insert. Uh, you would keep inserting records to a page, and then the modification log would become full, and then, and then you would, you know, and, and in the last record that you would insert, you would need to recompress, but then that compression would fail, and uh, in return you will split the page and compress those two. So, what uh, you know, what padding algorithm does is basically it eliminates. The need to recompress the the, the last uh, you know the the it basically eliminates the last compression that failed because the you know because the page is split earlier in the because of the uh, the padding restriction in the uncompressed page. Any questions? Yes. Free, free factor. Fill factor of the page. So this is not related to the fill factor of the page. Um, this is, you know, just separate variable. But um, in a way, it's similar because in fill factor you're trying to optimize for the efficiency of inserts, and in this case you're trying to optimize for the efficiency of compression. Um, but in the sense that you know, allocating empty space on a page, it's kind of similar. Um, any other questions? Yes. That is going. That I'm going to describe in later slides. Any other? Okay. So, uh, the algorithm to determine the path per table is actually quite simple. So, initially the padding size is zero, and then uh, for a period of t period of compression failures or Let's say for a period of time, we just uh, you know analyze the uh, failure rate, and if the failure rate is uh, more than what we want, then we just increase the padding size, and then we analyze, we keep analyzing. So we basically keep increasing the padding value until the compression failure rate for a table is is at the desired level. So if you specify you know you know at most five percent failure rate, then uh, you know the padding will increase until uh, you know the failure rate is five percent and it also decreases if it thinks that there are not enough compression failures so this means that if, if the compressibility characteristics of your data changes over time let's say your data was initially you know 1.8 x compressible and then it became 1.5 x compressible this algorithm will actually adapt to that change uh, and also it goes the other way too so if it was you know 1.5x compressible, and then it became 2x compressible. Then you will, you know, you will have no padding in the end. So you know, you will have some padding in the beginning, and then you will have no padding in the end. So, so going back to the insert benchmark, uh, the problem with stock MySQL was uh, the compression failure rate. So the compression failure rate was 41%. So 40% of the entire compression operations would fail in stock MySQL. And when you know when uh, when I looked at the uh, padding value for the for the uh, for the table that's the, the common table, uh, it was um, to, uh, about 2.5k. So this means that we just we restrict the amount of data on a page to be 13.5k. Uh, so this is in a way a trade-off between space and efficiency. And it's a very good trade-off because uh, you know it's it's 3.5k and you already uh, lose that space normally 
uh, for most of the pages because your data is not really 2x compressible. It's probably, you know, 1.8x compressible, yes? Per table, yes. No, it's in memory, so it will recompute. So in our, for our workloads, uh, the compute the the uh, convergence to the ideal pad value would take a few minutes. But yes, it is. Per, it's not per table. It's per. It's global. You have a question? Okay. Okay. Um, so that's so the, the so in this case you know we actually configured the uh, compression failure rate to be five percent. Uh, this is this also shows the uh, number of compression operations that were successful in stock MySQL and in our uh, in MySQL with our patch. So as you can see you know there were many compression failures in stock MySQL and we did we only had five percent. Um, this shows the time spent for the compression and decompression operations. So stock MySQL spends, you know, significant amount of more time on compression operations than, uh, you know, MySQL with the Facebook patch. And the uncompression time is, is, is similar. So um, we also made other improvements and I'm just going to briefly mention them. So InnoDB actually over allocated empty pages. So uh, whenever, you know, DB needs to extend uh, the, fi the file, uh, it would actually, uh, so basically it would, you know, you know, DB would trigger, would call the function to extend the file size when it determines that the current block is not, uh, is actually, you know, doesn't have enough empty pages. And that number was about 10%. So if the current segment did not have, uh, you know, almost 12% empty pages, then it would actually extend the file. And this is, you know, this is too much normally. Uh, and we just reduced this to 1%. And immediately, this was, you know, very simple change. And immediately we got, uh, you know, 10% reduction in the file size. Uh, InnoDB calls, uh, you know, the malloc calls are expensive, especially if you're using the glibc malloc. And, um, you know, they may, they may cause um, mutex contention. So in order to uh, you know, solve that problem, we basically um, cached our memory allocations. So compression actually uses uh, quite a bit of memory. So in order to compress a 16K page, you have to allocate like 250K memory. So uh, we, you know, we just um, cached those memories um, to uh, prevent excessive number of calls to malloc and free. Uh, we added hardware accelerated checksum for compressed pages. I think it works. It's uh, ten times as fast as the default InnoDB checksum. Uh, InnoDB uses fast checksum for uncompressed pages, but it was not implemented for the compressed pages. And there's an option. So Zlib actually uh, computes uh, checksums for the data that it compresses, and there's an option uh, that you can specify uh, to Zlib functions that will actually make Zlib not, you know, compute these checksums. And InnoDB by default does not do that. So we added an option to actually, uh, you know, disable these uh, checksum functions so that, you know, the, uh, at least the Zlib functions will not uh, compute the checksum. Because we already, you know, compute the checksum of the compressed page and that's, that's good enough. Uh, future work. So <coughs> PageZip Compress is the function that compresses a page. And it actually spends, the time that it spends on the uh, actual compression functions is the 20%, is 20 percent of the total time that's spent in the entire function. So what this means is we are spending too much time on encoding the data that's compressed on a page than the compression itself. And this is, this is a problem and we are going to fix this. Uh, we are going to test larger page sizes, larger blocks uh, tend to have better compression ratio. So, you know, we're going to try. Um, we're going to try prefix compression. Uh, you know, basically have a prefix compression of the data before passing the data to the compression functions. 
Uh, we're going to try other compression algorithms like Snappy, QuickLZ. Some of these algorithms are better in terms of uh, speed than Zlib. But uh, again, it doesn't make sense to try those algorithms before rewriting PageZip Compress because the time that we spend in you know, compression functions is, is, is not significant in comparison to the total time we spend in PageZip Compress. And we hope to get 3x compression in production. Uh, with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes, Thomas. Can I correct that there are compressed pages and buffer pool, you need a smaller buffer and a larger one. So that is why the IOS is small, the major one, and they're small. So you mean you need, can you, can you say that again? So you need smaller buffer pool? Smaller buffer pool because the pages in it are compressed, so that's where the IO will Um, so you're saying that the actual number of pages in buffer pool are less? It's so bigger because they are smaller and store more pages in buffer pool. Oh, you think that's very, oh, okay. Well, um, okay, okay. Yes? Regarding what? Yes. Right, so what we do is basically uh, we just write a log record of saying that this page was compressed. So basically, um, earlier, so what would happen earlier is, let's go back to um, one of the slides. Let's see. Um, okay. So let's see. So what, what happens to you here is that, let's say, let's look at this. Yeah, okay. So what happens here is that as you have inserts, um, you will have, you know, just an insert log record here. So stuck in ODB will just log an insert in the first insert, and then it will log another insert until you recompress the page. When you recompress the page, it will, you know, it will actually not log the insert, and it will log the entire compressed page image because, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, the previous inserts if you have the entire page. So what we did was. Uh, remove the log record for, uh, for the compression and add back the, uh, uh, the log record for the last insert. And then after that, we have a log record that says to compress the page that doesn't have any data. And assuming that the, the compression is deterministic, that it compresses to the same size, uh, you know, this, this should work. Uh, yes? Could you talk about I did not really um, benchmark those systems uh, with compression, um, but I mean, in, in our production, there weren't any significant issues. Or do you want to make a comment on that? So it's, it, it turns out to be better. I mean, I didn't test it, but um, there weren't. So we actually deployed this. So. We didn't see any anything, any problem. So I would assume it's either better or equivalent. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Ah, so, okay. So the question is, why don't we get, so assuming that we're IO bound and not CPU bound, why don't we get um, better throughput with compression for, for compressed version? Uh, that's a good question. I, I well, I, I don't know the answer exactly, um, but uh, I would assume that it involves, uh, I, I agree that, you know, that we can do better. Um, and um, I, I think it's because of the uh, CPU overhead as of now, but I agree that. Yes, we, we use it for disk space. And um, yeah, and also, you know, we're, that, that, that benchmark m might not necessarily, um, uh, you know, simulate what we have in our production also. Yes. Yes, yes, it would work. Yes? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Can I say it again? Uh, so, the question is, uh, is it better to have smaller inserts than the sm small record sizes than uh, having large record sizes? You mean blobs, for example? Is that what you're asking? Uh, right. That's correct. So that is correct, but at the same time, there's a limit uh, of the uh, record that's placed in the page itself. So I actually did not go, uh, you know, I gave a simple diagram here, but actually, you know, you would store uh, the, uh, you know, the you know, big portion of the data. If, if, the, if the row is really large, then it would be stored in external pages. So you would have blob pointers. Uh, to, to the data, so I'm, I'm guessing it won't be too big of a difference in terms of you know, in terms of the modification log. Yes. What type of data? You mean any any table can be compressed? Uh, Uh, we compress based on uh, the compressibility uh, characteristics of the table. So we just uh, compress all the tables first in, in our test servers and send them a, a copy of our production traffic and determine the t which tables to compress based on that and, and, uh, and how much they compress. So that's how we determine. So the problem with that is, so are you um, ma uh, figuring, are you mentioning that, you know, just uh, compress the entire uh, file system? Like a user space file system that actually compresses? Okay. Um, well, I, I think that would perform poorly. But, um, and, and the reason for that is uh, when you're doing the I.O. of reads, you know, you don't want to spend too much time, extra time. Uh, but I mean, you know, I didn't, do it, so I can't say for sure. So the, you will get better compression. So most, you know, the, the likelihood of uh, the compressibility of a table will increase if you have string columns, you know, string character columns. But if a table is, uh, you know, mostly integers, it might still be compressible. Uh, you, the only, the surest way is to just uh, get a portion of the table and compress it and see how it, how well it compresses. Some of it, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to be you know, some, porting some of the patches to 5.6. 5.6, yeah. Yes. The difference is uh, for the throughputs that I demonstrated with a pure insert uh, benchmark, uh, it was uh, our, the compression with our patch uh, performs uh, half as bad as the uncompressed, but uh, stock MySQL compression performs about you know, one fifteenth throughput of the, uh, you know. It's, so, so ours is, you know, ours is a, an improvement over uh, uh, MySQL's compressed, but it's twice as bad as the uncompressed. So, um, yeah, I don't have numbers for that. Sorry, but it, it works on our workload, it, which is a primarily I bound workload. So it, it works for our workload. I guess the surest way would be just to try. Yes, currently, yes, I would say that. So we're we're in the process of doing that um, because of our scale. We can't just compress all the servers at once. Uh, I showed you the, the I don't know if you were here, but I showed a graph where um, you know we, we see a drop in the average uh, disk database size, 
and that's because of the um, compression of the servers in batch. Yes. Yeah, I am. I am totally outraged that uh, it's taking too long to compress all of our data centers. So the insert benchmark is kind of update intensive. Is that what you meant, or? Uh, I did not particularly test that benchmark, but um, you know we have updates in our actual workload. Um, so I'm yes, <laughs> I, I, yeah. So I, I I don't know. Uh, no. So initially we had you know crashes and stuff, uh, but after you know fixing those, we haven't seen any data corruption. Okay, I think that's, that's the end.